Hey guys, Mr. Klein here. We are starting a new chapter, Chapter 13, Lesson 1, Describing the Weather. A lot of information in this uh, chapter, but a lot of it is common sense and stuff that we kind of know about because we've observed because we've seen the weather our entire lives. So let's go ahead and get started. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to answer these three questions. One, what is weather? Two, what variables are used to describe weather? And three, how is weather related to the water cycle? Let's so, so let's go ahead and get started. In fact, let's answer the very first question. What is weather? The definition for weather is this, the atmospheric conditions along with some short-term changes at the certain place at a certain time. That is weather. Difference between weather and climate is this. Weather are the atmospheric conditions, mainly precipitation, which we'll get to later, and uh, temperature at one point in time. Okay, climate is temperature and precipitation over a longer period of time, for example, summer or a year or things like that. That's climate. But what we're specifically talking about is weather. And when it comes to weather, we use a lot of variables, lots of different things that help us determine what the weather is like. And the people who do that are what we call meteorologists, okay? Most meteorologists, when we think of them, are the weather guys who uh, do the weather on your local television station. Uh, but not all of not all meteorologists are weathermen on TV. In fact, not all weathermen on the television are even meteorologists. Some of them are just journalists who are paid to describe the weather, and they don't do any predicting or anything like that themselves. So meteorologists are people who study and they predict weather, and they use computer models and things like that, which we'll get into later. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's get going with the, the variables. The first one is air temperature. Okay, well air temperature, you know, how hot or how cold it is, is simply the measure of the average kinetic energy of molecules in the air. That's really a fancy definition for any uh, any definition of temperature. Of course, molecules in warm air will move faster than molecules in cooler air because they have more kinetic energy. Okay, so that's air temperature. The next one is what we call air pressure. Okay, uh, air pressure is the pressure that a column of air exerts on the sur on the air or the surface below it. Uh, air pressure is the weight of all the air in the atmosphere in a certain area pushing down on you. And what we use to uh, determine air pressure is what we call a barometer, which is here's a simple barometer right here. Essentially all the weight of all of the uh, all of the air is pushing down on this right here. This is mercury, kind of what you see in old thermometers. Okay, it pushes down on the mercury and it pushes up in this tube. Okay. And at sea level, 29.92 inches high is what atmospheric pressure is, or 14 pounds per square inch, or one kilobar, okay, uh, or one bar rather, which is uh, 1,000, 1,000 little bars, which are the measurement of air pressure at the metric system, okay. So one atmosphere, that's what it is, 29.92 inches high. Uh, in the United States, we tend to use barometric pressure. We talk about inches. So, uh, other places with metric will use millibars and things like that. Okay, so 1,000 millibars equals one bar. So that's the air pressure. Now, of course, air pressure decreases as altitude increases. In addition, the warmer it is, usually air pressure will be decreased because there's more space because the air molecules are moving around. Okay, and like I just said, the instrument we use to measure air pressure is the barometer. Okay, so when we hear barometric pressure, we're talking about air pressure. Okay, and what we talked about in class already is wind. Wind is caused by air moving from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. Okay, the faster wind is, okay, the more of a difference in air pressure between the two spots. Okay, so if you have huge areas without a lot of big pressure change, air will be calm. But like, for example, when a cold front passes through, it's warm on one side of the front, it's cold on the other side, winds will blow quickly because that's a big difference in air pressure. Now, whenever we talk about winds, we talk about direction. And the direction of the wind is the direction that it's coming from. So, for example, if we have a south wind, the wind is coming from the south. Okay, it's going from south to north. So if a wind's coming from the north, it's coming north, push from the north, pushing down to the south. And the instrument we use to measure wind speed is what we call an anemometer. Okay, an anemometer is essentially is one of the oldest things after you know barometer and a thermos, uh, thermometer. And that's what this is on the right. Essentially, you have cups. 
And the cups catch the wind and they spin around in circles. And they're usually connected to, uh, early on you would count the revolutions of it. But nowadays we have a generator. And what it does is it, uh, it measures the amount of electricity created by the generator. And we convert that to a formula that tells us the airspeed. In the United States we talk about airspeed in terms of miles per hour. Of course, every, uh, in the metric system we'll generally use meters per second uh, for wind speeds. Or sometimes they'll even use kilometers per hour. So... So, so far we have temperature, okay, and we use a thermometer to measure that. Of course, the United States, Fahrenheit is the temperature range, and then uh, Celsius elsewhere, so the metric system. Air pressure uh, uses a barometer, and wind is measured with an anemometer. Okay, so let's get going for the next ones. The amount of water vapor in the air, the amount of evaporated, you know, water in a gaseous state is what we call the humidity. Where we are at in South Louisiana, it is very humid, especially in the summertime. There's a lot of water vapor in the air, mainly because we're right next to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, there's a term whenever air can only hold so much water vapor. And when air is saturated, it holds the maximum amount of water vapor possible at that temperature. Okay, At certain amounts of temperature, uh, a meter of air or square foot of air can hold only so much water vapor. After that, the water vapor starts coalescing into water droplets and can fall as rain. Okay, So that term, the amount of water vapor in the air compared to the maximum amount of water vapor that can hold at that temperature is what we call relative humidity. And we measure that, you, we can use what's called a hygrometer. Okay or a wet bulb, th wet dry bulb thermometer. And this measurement is reported as a percentage. In the summers, we will usually have in South Louisiana 50 to 60 percent is our relative humidity. Uh, there are times when it gets cool uh, that the relative humidity, especially right before a rainstorm, can get to 100 percent. And that's when it's so muggy and sticky and when you sweat it just kind of sits there and it's disgusting. Okay, that's relative humidity at 100 percent. Now, what we have right here is a wet and dry bulb thermometer. So what we've done is we have a thermometer right here, and it gets the air temperature, okay? And right here, this thermometer is attached to a piece of cloth which is soaked in water. And so what we do is we measure the two, okay? And we divide the wet bulb thermometer temperature by the dry bulb thermometer temperature, and we get that percentage. So for example, this is 20 degrees Celsius, this is 25. Okay, so we divide 20 into 25, we get 80%. So what's the humidity? Relative humidity, 80% of that. Okay, so that's relative humidity. Now, when air near the ground becomes saturated, water vapor condenses into a liquid and forms what we call dew. Okay, especially here in Louisiana, dew is all, we see it all the time, pretty much every morning. Okay, it's kind of weird when we don't have dew. Okay, when it gets really cold though, especially during the winter time, and at the time of this lesson, we ha we've, we've caught it one or two times, but if the air temperature dips below zero degrees Celsius, the dew freezes up, okay? even if it's for a short period of time. And this is what we call frost. Uh, we all don't get a lot of freezes, but we do get a lot of frost, which what will happen is the dew freezes up and you see that layer, you see that layer of ice. And then once it, uh, once it warms up, that melts off. Now, the temperature, uh, related to relative humidity, the temperature at which air becomes fully saturated because the temperature decreases while the amount of moisture stays constant is what we call the dew point. Okay, the dew point, in other words, is the temperature where air becomes fully saturated, where relative humidity equals 100%. Okay, the temperature goes down, okay, and it reaches the dew point when, at that point, it becomes saturated. When, when the uh, humidity amount of water vapor remains the same, but the temperature goes down to meet it. So at that temperature, the dew point is where the air is fully saturated. Now, what happens when the air is fully saturated? Well, it, like I said, the uh, the water vapor will begin to coalesce and come together, okay? And so that's how we get precipitation. But how does precipitation form? Well, what will happen is warm air, as it rises into the atmosphere, it will cool down. When the air cools enough and it reaches the dew point, okay, small droplets of water will form. And what we call clouds are essentially water droplets or ice crystals suspended in the atmosphere. It's where it gets cool enough where they come together and... Uh, they sit there in the atmosphere, and the water, the clouds, and the water vapor, and the droplets all start bouncing together. Now, 
Clouds near the Earth's surface are what we call fog. South Louisiana has fog, especially in the fall and the springtime, and it has to do with the dew point. Uh, when it reaches the dew point, especially when it gets cool in the evenings. Okay, so essentially a fog is like driving through a cloud. Now, there are several different types of clouds. We're just going to hit the top three, and in class we're going to go into more detail, but let's hit the big three I uh, want. The flat white layered clouds are what we call stratus clouds. Those are the nice big fluffy clouds. Okay. And so we see those right here. That's what we think of when we think of a cloud. We usually think of that. Uh, clouds uh, that are present, I'm sorry, cumulus clouds between 2,000 and 6,000 meters in altitude. The flat white and layer clouds are what we call stratus clouds, and that's the ones we see right here. Stratus and cumulus are most of the time what we think of when we think of clouds, and also the ones at high level above 6,000 meters are what we call cirrus clouds. Okay? And they're wispy, and they're present above 6,000 meters in altitude, and they're usually made of ice. Uh, the other type of cloud is usually rain-bearing clouds, and we call those nimbostratus, uh, nimbo clouds, uh, nimbus clouds. So we have, and those are usually those dark gray clouds. Okay, so you can all have all sorts of mixtures. For example, you can have stratus, you can stratus stratocumulus, which is usually a mix of the two. Uh, alto stratus are uh, mid-level clouds, stratus clouds higher up, alto cumulus or cumulus clouds higher up, then you can mix up cirrostratus and cirrocumulus clouds. In Louisiana, we'll especially see these after a front. And then, of course, there are the thunderstorm clouds, which are cumulonimbus clouds, and they can go up way above 6,000 6, meters and actually reach the trop top of the troposphere. And we talk about thunderstorms and wind fronts and severe weather. We're going to get into detail about cumulonimbus clouds. But for right now, Let's just think about the big three. The big three are stratus clouds. They're usually low and they're flat. Cumulus clouds are a little higher up and they're fluffy. And cirrus clouds are those wispy clouds that you see way up there. And they're mainly made of ice crystals rather than uh, liquid. So what happens when uh, clouds, especially uh, nimbus clouds and cumulonimbus clouds, get enough precipitation? Well, uh, to fall. Precipitation is water in liquid or solid form that falls from the atmosphere. Precipitation that falls as liquid water, of course, is rain, and we get that a lot here in Louisiana. Precipitation that is solid crystals of ice is snow. We don't get a lot of that in Louisiana. Okay. However, occasionally when there's winter time, we'll have precipitation that starts as snow, then melts and freezes again, and we call that sleet. Uh, more often than not, we will get sleet before we get snow, so let's talk about how sleet forms. If you remember when we were talking about heat layer, uh, uh, heat, we talk about heat rises, and whenever we're talking about uh, temperature uh, temperature movement uh, in heat movement in the atmosphere, we talked about inversion, where a cold layer, uh, a warm layer gets caught between two cold layers, and essentially sleet forms as a result of that. So up here at high altitude, it's really cold, and snow begins to fall. Okay, it falls, and when it reaches a certain altitude, the air that's trapped that that inverted layer sits there and it's warmer than freezing. So what does the snow do? It melts and it begins falling as rain. However, once it gets through the inversion to the cold layer near the surface, it's below freezing. So what do the raindrops do? They refreeze and they fall. And so what you see right here in this picture with a penny for comparison is sleet. Uh, if it's a heavy sleeting, it'll cover the ground and it'll be nice and white. It kind of looks like snow, but we don't have snowflakes. If there's small little pellets like this, that's sleet. Okay? So that, that's the difference between sleet and snow. Now, what happens when we have precipitation form when ice pellets rise and fall within a cloud, especially during a rainstorm, a severe weather, is what we call hail. Uh, essentially what happens is this, is you'll have uplift, which is uh, warm air within a thunderous cloud pushing up air. And so what happens is uh, the air droplet, the water droplets go up and they freeze. Okay, They begin to fall. Well, because there's more warm air pushing up, they get pushed up and they gather more water. Well, they get up and they freeze again. And this cycle continues to happen until the ice, this chunk of ice gets too uh, heavy in order to be pulled down, to stay up, and gravity takes over and falls down. And that's a piece of hail, like you see right here. So each of these layers, okay, and the, and the hailstone right here is a layer in which the 
little piece of hail went up into the clouds, went up and froze, and it went to come down, but the wind kept on getting it up. And it gets so it gets so heavy to the point where the winds can't keep it up and they fall. Okay, Usually they'll have pea-sized hail, marble size. Occasionally you'll have bigger uh, softball, grapefruit, even bigger than that can fall, and they can cause a lot of damage. But we normally see hail with severe weather. So four types of precipitation. Liquid water is rain. Frozen water that freezes and floats down in a crystal shape is snow. Snow that falls, melts, and refreezes on its way down is what we call sleet. And then water droplets that stay up in thunderstorms uh, and create large chunks of ice before they fall down are what we call hail. So, how does all this relate to the water cycle? Well, remember that the water cycle is the series of natural processes which water continually moves among oceans, land, and the atmosphere. Okay, the water enters the atmosphere usually as water vapor when liquid water on Earth's sur surface evaporates. Okay, water evaporates. You have a rainstorm goes through, there's puddles, the water evaporates. It goes up into the clouds and begins cooling and it condenses, forming liquid water droplets. Clouds cons consist of water droplets. The water droplets get together and they get too big for gravity to hold them down and then they fall, which is precipitation, when liquid or frozen water falls to the Earth's surface. So that's how the water cycle is uh, how, it, how it is affected by weather. So let's go ahead and let's wrap this lesson up. By the end of this lesson, you would have been able to answer these questions. What's weather? Well, it's the atmospheric conditions along with short-term changes at a certain place at a certain time. Okay. And so what variables, how do we describe weather? Well, we describe it in a lot of ways. We talk about air temperature. We talk about air pressure. Okay, That's the amount of weight of air is pushing down on a given place. Wind, the movement of air. Humidity, the amount of water vapor in there. The dew point, it's the temperature in which air becomes saturated. Clouds, which are uh, organized areas of water vapor and water droplets in the sky. And precipitation, which is condensed water that falls from the sky. Now. How is weather related to the water cycle? Well, we just said that. And so what essentially happens is water, va water evaporates in the atmosphere when the air temperature is warm. It falls back to Earth when the temperature is cool enough for condensation and precipitation. So there you go. That's the real basics of weather. We're going to go into it in more detail, especially in class. But as always, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Thanks for watching.